Hey friend, it's episode 398 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Welcome. My name is Leanne Vogel. I blog over at healthfulpursuit.com. I'm also the international bestselling author of the Keto Diet, the Keto Diet Cookbook, Keto for Women, Holistic Nutritionist, Master in Blood Chemistry. I kind of do a lot of things. And what I recently did was start working out. I made a commitment to go 90 days working out every day. I'm now on day 120. I can't even believe it. I wanted to have Coach Bronson on to chat with us about how to stick with these commitments about diet and workouts and motivation and how to shift our way of kind of seeing all of this. And so Coach Bronson has been guiding and training people in health and fitness for over 10 years. He started CrossFit around his 40th birthday and quickly fell in love with all the variety, community coaching and results. It didn't take long for him to realize that learning more about fitness and becoming a coach was the next path his life was taking. Coach Bronson opened a CrossFit gym in 2014. And as a gym owner, helping people with their overall health and fitness, he developed successful programs to improve his clients quality of life and physical freedom consistently and sustainably. In 2018, Coach Bronson discovered how an animal based nutrition lifestyle optimized his metabolic health and performance. Since then, he has designed specific methods to use both nutrition and fitness to radically improve the lives of people all over the world. Coach Bronson is the author of the ultimate ketogenic fitness cookbook, a complete guide to optimizing keto for a better quality quality of life. He offers a coaching program, one-on-one consultations, and runs a very successful 10-week health and fitness challenge for people of all walks of life. You can find him on YouTube, Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness, his website, ultimateketogenicfitness.com. On Instagram, he's coach underscore Bronson underscore keto. He's also on Facebook, Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness, and his book is The Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness Book. Okay, so today we're talking about signs it's time to switch up your macros, uh, tools for long-term carnivore, how the body fuels itself during keto, how to fuel on and off your gym program, and really how to fuel before and after. We talk a little bit about carnivore. We don't really get into it. I, I personally don't love carnivore for most people, but I love having people on that disagree with me on that. <laughs> We also talk about how to find a good gym that aligns with your goals, how to be responsible in your active recovery, the seven movements that your body needs to learn how to do, like squatting and lunges and pushes, and we go through more movements in the recording, how to gauge success for yourself outside of weight loss, and encouragement no matter where you're at in your journey, okay? So we're going to be talking about diet workouts, motivation, and how all of this culminates to build a program that works for you. So without further ado, let's cut over to today's interview. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel, and you're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've put together a free 21-page guide on achieving weight loss on your keto diet if nothing is working as a little thank you for being here today. Grab your free guide at ketoforwomen.com to get the steps you need to overcome the hurdles standing in your way. Hi, Coach Bronson. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's, I've been waiting for this. Like I'm like, okay, when is this, this going to happen? When is this going to happen? I got to do it. <laughs> it's so true because you booked on my calendar and then there were issues and now we're, we had technical issues. So it's like, we are finally here. We are doing this thing. I can't wait to share your story with people and your approach to everything. It's, it's really awesome. Um, before we kind of dive in, I, I used your official bio to kind of introduce you. But okay. can you tell us in a few words what you're all about, what lights you up and why you do this work? Yeah. What lights me up is seeing people achieve physical freedom. There's a lot of the aspects that we talk about in the keto space, in fitness and health in general, where we tend to look at specific metrics that have to do with how we look and how we feel about ourselves. And we often miss that really what we're trying to do is live better lives. And taking that as being the ultimate measure that we're all trying to move to, I think, helps put some puzzle pieces in place 
that makes the process a little easier to understand for a lot of people. I started out with uh, being overweight and not being happy with where I was. I was, you know, thought I was an in shape kind of guy, realized I wasn't, and used fitness as the first step along the way on, on my path to try to make a change. Got really far along that path, but realized I was still sick. I was still not healthy. I still had things about myself that I didn't like and needed to find a nutrition solution. And so the combination of fitness, nutrition, learning a lot of things about what the process of change is and studying studying the human behavior and behavior change and things like that and getting into coaching, there's a lot of aspects of mindset as well that go into this journey. So bringing the three of those things together, mindset, nutrition, and fitness is really what gets fired me up because I think that's what it really takes, the three pillars together to really make a change that's going to impact people. And yeah, exactly. And that's really what I wanted to focus on in our conversation today is diet, movement, motivation. So really those three core pieces to what you talk about on your platform. And so why don't we start off with the diet aspect? If, If somebody is eating keto, at what point should they start thinking about carnivore or like how do they how do they figure out what kind of template is going to be best for them? Yeah. So carnivore is what everybody should be doing. No, I'm kidding. The, the, the switch from keto to carnivore for most people that I see and my, the majority of people I work with are women over 40. And what I see a lot of times is they've been doing keto for six months, a year, two years, five years, and they've seen some progress. They've lost some weight. They've taken care of some health issues. And they're just realizing there's still like something missing. They're not reaching their weight goal or they're not feeling quite as good as they see other people feeling. They still have issues with energy or they feel weak and like they just, there's just, they're not, they got to their weight goal maybe, but it didn't make the impact in change in their life that they thought it was going to make. So carnivore can be a tool. In many cases, I'll just use myself for an example. I was low carb and whole foods for a couple of years before I went carnivore. I still had gut issues. I still had excess body fat. I still had issues with energy. I still had issues with injuries and recovering from physical activity. There were a lot of things that still weren't as good as it could be. The, within months of going carnivore and completely eliminating plant-based foods, fiber, and all the other stuff, all of those things disappeared. My gut health improved a hundredfold. My workouts, I went from working out two or three days a week and feeling like I got run over by a truck to working out five days a week, six days a week and feeling great the whole time. All of my performance markers improved. The injuries that I had been dealing with, I had pulled muscles, you know, rotator cuff issues. I had herniated discs in my neck. I had a bunch of issues that all kind of resolved themselves and healed and just kind of went away. So I think it's a great thing to do. Um, And if you decide that you want to do it, and try it for 30, 60, 90 days, you may be totally blown away by the impact it has on your progress. Um, And then it's up to you to decide, do I want to test things and try to reintroduce things or do I want to stay this way? For me, I tried it as an experiment and here I am four and a half years later and I personally don't see myself ever going back. You totally got me when you said everyone should be carnivore. I was like, um, I I was told I will wait to see if it's a joke and then we will go from there. So thanks for the tension there. That was great. Um, So it sounds like some of the symptoms or goals that point to a shift in macros needed is some of the gut stuff going on, in your opinion, maybe some of the body composition stuff like or or even energy while you're working out. Are those some of the things that I heard you say? Yeah, absolutely. If we look at how we define and the the definition, this is the fun part about this whole process is the definition is going to be different for everybody. How does an individual how does an individual define quality of life? And for some people, it's going to be defined by the things they currently can't do. For some people, it's going to be defined by some of the things that they don't want to do. Some people don't want to take medication. If they can get off the medication, then that's an improvement in their quality of life. For some people, I want they want to be able to go on hikes or play with their grandkids, and they currently can't do that. So that's something that is a limitation currently. So anything that we can do to resolve those, those issues, blockages, either direction is going to be beneficial. And I think from a... Uh, nutrition perspective, the easiest way to do that is to cut out as much as possible and get to the base foundational uh, definition of what the proper human diet is. Animal-based carbs are limited. Fiber is limited. You're getting animal-based meat. You're getting animal-based fat, and you are provided with the cleanest most easily processed nutrients that you can get. That's going to allow your body to do all of the things that it wants to do without interference. 
And that's really where keto is good. That's where carnivore is good. Carnivore is a ketogenic diet. So I don't want anybody to get confused there. It's not not keto. It is a version of keto that removes plant-based uh, foods from the equation because oftentimes plant-based foods are causing problems that people are not aware that they're that are being caused. So until you cut them out, you don't know what's happening in your body. And you may realize, and it's different for everybody. Some people may cut out, you know, for me, I cut out I was doing mostly green leafy vegetables. I cut those out and my gut has been amazing ever since. I will probably never go back to green leafy vegetables. I can do coffee. I don't have a problem with that. I used to be lactose intolerant. I couldn't even smell cheese without having issues. Now I can have cheese a couple of times a week and it doesn't bother me. So everybody's a little bit different and what the response is going to be is going to be different. What things heal, what things improve is totally an individual process. If there's one thing we all learned and can remember from high school, it's that the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> and over the past couple of years, we've all been hearing more and more and more about the massive role they play in our energy levels, good metabolism, brain function. But how much are you actually aware of them and what are you doing day to day to keep them healthy? I won't go into the full biology lesson that like I would love to on the importance of mitochondria, but let me just point out some major reasons why you should care about them. If you often feel exhausted and you don't have the energy to enjoy your life and accomplish your daily goals, such as going to the gym, spending more time with friends and family, etc. If you deal with brain fog every day that's affecting your performance at work, your mood, your personal relationships, and even your hobbies. If you're going keto, paleo, or any sort of other low carb diet and you're not reaching your fitness goals fast enough or just feeling like you're totally flat, or maybe you simply feel like you're getting too old too fast, your mitochondria aren't healthy and you need a boost. Now, Capex gets your mitochondria rocking. A blend of protease, lipase, L-carnitine, dandelion root, CoQ10, and more. If you take three to five capsules of Capex in the morning on an empty stomach, energy, mental clarity, and focus should come flooding in. And if you're following a low carb program like keto, you'll be giving your body the tools it needs to take your results to the next level. You can check it out at K energize.com slash keto diet. That's K E N E R G I Z E.com forward slash keto diet. If you visit the site today, you can get 10% off any package using the code keto diet 10. That's keto diet one zero. Again, that's K energize slash keto diet and use the coupon code keto diet 10 for 10% off. That's cool. And this is why I love having guests on, on the show because it is such an individualized process. And I know that we attract those individuals that just, I don't know, like align with our message and they feel something in their body when they're hearing us speak. And they're like, yeah, I want what this person is talking about. And that's like the beauty of the internet and all the things. I know that when we're talking about carnivore, when we're top, talking about limiting a specific macronutrient, specifically carbohydrates, I know that myself, personally, I'm terrible at carnivore. I don't have the body type to be able to handle carnivore. My gut requires plants. I love plants. They feel good. I am so flat down and out doing carnivore. I can't even function. And so that's why I like to have people on the show to talk about other forms of feeding themselves. Though I do have clients that eat carnivore and do really well on it. I think it's important to kind of, as a practitioner, not only is your personal experience helpful, but also just understanding the body, how it works and when to recommend certain things. And I think one of the areas that I think a lot of people have challenge understanding is the whole, how do we get our energy in hardcore workouts where we're really pushing it when it comes to not having glucose? Can we go through just those specifics? Yeah, it's the, uh, we can get, yeah, we, for sure. The, the idea that we don't have glycogen in our bodies if we don't eat it is not, is not how it works. We have this wonderful process in our body called gluconeogenesis, which a lot of people misunderstand and they don't realize that 
Gluconeogenesis is actually not a single process. Gluconeogenesis is the name for an umbrella of processes, the Cori cycle, the Krebs cycle, ketogenesis, glycolysis. There's a bunch of different things that happen in the under the umbrella of gluconeogenesis that helps our body generate or convert or create glycogen from other things. So we often think about gluconeogenesis as that's what's going to turn your steak into sugar in your blood. And that is true to a point. The amount of steak you would have to eat to make that happen is more than anyone's going to consume. But it is that is definitely part of the process. The really cool part about gluconeogenesis is that it actually feeds off of ketogenesis. So when you're ketogenic, when you, and there's a difference between being ketogenic and being in ketosis, which we can talk about if you want to. Um, but when you're ketogenic, when your body is primarily uh, good at burning fatty acids as fuel, converting fatty acids into ketones and using ketones for fuel, when your body is good at doing that, it creates a couple different kinds of ketones. Some of those ketones, BHB, is used for fuel. Some of those ketones, acetoacetate, is converted into other substances like lactate and pyruvate that get pushed into gluconeogenesis to be used to create glycogen. So if you're ketogenic, you are actually supporting an internal process in your body to help create glycogen. So your body will replenish and provide glycogen to your muscles as needed without you having to eat any at all. Very cool. And to kind of go a step further, because we see influencers, people on the internet talking about their pre and post workout, and a lot of them have carbohydrates and bananas and all the things. How are we supposed to do pre and post workout on a ketogenic or ketogenic slash carnivore diet? What have you seen works really well? Yeah. So there's a, there's a two parts to this, I think. And one is if we talk, if we're, if we're assuming that we're low carb, and that we don't need carbs, because here's the thing, you do not, there is nobody listening to your podcast. Okay. There's nobody that listens to my podcast. There's nobody that, that follows me on Instagram or anything like that. Nobody that I work with. Okay. I.e. normal everyday people who are just trying to improve the quality of life. Okay. We're not talking about elite athletes who are performing on the world stage. A normal everyday person does not need to ingest carbohydrates in order to do exercise flat out. They don't need to do it. The, the intensity and the volume of work that an average person is doing to just improve their general physical ability is is not going to require eating carbs before, during, or after exercise. Your body will handle it 100%. So that's the first thing to understand. If you're going to try to fuel yourself for exercise, it's really, and most of the people I work with, it's really just a matter of how do you respond to eating before, during, or after. Some people can eat an hour, an hour and a half before a workout, and they're fine. Other people try to eat an hour, an hour and a half before a workout, and they feel like they're going to puke halfway through their workout. Some people feel great fasted when they go to their workout. Some people feel like they're dragging th through mud if they don't eat before their workout. So it's completely different for each person. Um, and nobody in the average world is trying to build their performance up to a point where spending the overhead and the mental extra energy to figure out every minor detail about how to optimize their food intake for physical activity is going to make a difference. If that makes sense. Completely it does. Yep. Completely it does. So I guess there's no key to what we should be doing before or after. I know like for myself personally, what I've found is really beneficial is a little bit of caffeine MCT oil and a tiny bit of protein, like five or 10 grams before a workout. If I'm really pushing it, if I'm not like I'm just doing a Pilates workout, then eh, I could skip it. And then post-workout, I find I do good on like maybe a little bit of like beef protein or something like a half hour after. Do we need to get that specific or? If you want to, but you don't need to. So there's a couple things. Here's just a couple of general guidelines or general things to understand about how this stuff fits together so that people can play around with and see what works for them. Okay. Sodium intake an hour and a half to two hours prior to is super helpful from an energy perspective. If you want to feel like a Olympic athlete while you're doing your exercise, take an extra gram or two grams of sodium an hour and a half to two hours before your exercise. You are going to feel like an absolute animal in the gym. So that's something to think about. If you're going to eat some food, do it within an hour of exercise, because here's the deal. It's going to take an hour to an hour and a half for that food, depending on what you're eating. I'm not talking about a shake. A shake might go faster, but if you're eating real whole food, which is what I'm assuming people are eating, I would say an hour before 
is going to give your stomach time to digest that food and start moving it into your small intestine. So once that food exits your stomach and it's starting to go through your intestine, your digestive tract, when you start working out, your digestion slows down. So what you want to do is have some food primed in the system so that when you're going out of the exercise into a parasympathetic state, you don't have to start the whole process from your mouth to your intestine. It's already there waiting, right? So you don't have to worry about, oh, I have to find a fast acting protein shake to get it in and through my system as quick as possible. It's already in there. It's ready to go. It's whole foods. It's working the way it needs to work and it's not processed crap. So that's something else to think about. So those are really the two biggest things to think about. Making sure you're getting your electrolytes prior to your exercise. You're going to find all sorts of things that that does for your ability to perform and how you feel throughout the workout. And then if you're going to eat, if you want to prime, I call it priming the protein, eat a little bit before so that you have it in your system ready to go, then you don't technically have to eat anything after your exercise because it's already in your digestive system and it's going to be there for six hours. Completely, completely. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can definitely relate to the sodium before workouts. I love Element. Have you tried Element before? Oh, uh, five to 10 a day. <laughs> I love that stuff. I am obsessed. I love it so much. Yes, totally agree with you. Okay, let's we've talked so much about diet. Let's kind of shift gears and talk about the actual workouts because every workout is a little bit different. Do you find that there's a specific type of workout understanding that 99% of the people listening are women. So is there a specific type of workout that works best? I'm going to say specifically for weight loss and building muscle. Yeah. So I want to make a very clear distinction that women do not need to work out differently than anybody else. Okay. The, the issue that when we talk about women and exercise, what we tend to make a distinction is that guys are just trying to get big and strong. Women need to be strong. They may not want to get big, but they need to be strong. So the workout and guys aren't going to get big just because they work out and get strong. You have to try to get big. So without the differentiation of the big, right? We don't want to get huge. I don't want to get huge, right? I'm 50 years old. I want to be functional till I'm 90. That's my goal. So when we talk about women and exercise, the number one mistake that women make is they are afraid to get strong and they avoid strength training. And I think that is a huge, huge mistake. The The focus on getting strong has an impact on so many levels that enable women to manage stress better, have better self-confidence, be, be more energetic and be able to do more things throughout the day and just in general increase every single aspect of their quality of life across the board. So, you know, you said a lot, a lot of your listeners to the podcast are women in the 35 plus range. 90% of my clientele are women over 40. Uh, I work primarily, I would, if I were to highlight that even closer, focus in on that demographic, I would say most of them are over 50. So most of my clientele are peri and postmenopausal and building strength in those women is where they see the most impact on their life. They have better fat loss. They have better sustainability. They have better quality of life. They have better everything when they look at how do they actually improve their physical function instead of just focusing on weight loss. And that's the biggest thing about fitness I want people to understand is that you cannot have a high quality of life if you don't have a high level of physical ability. And that's why we do fitness. So what fitness people should be doing is moving their body. There's a bunch of different ways that the human body moves and we should be able to move in all of those different ways. We should be training all of the components of how our body performs. So there's strength things that we need to do. There's endurance things that we need to do. There are things that improve our balance and coordination. That needs to be part of your training. So it's a broad range of various different things. It's not just one thing. Uh, and then we need to be able to train how well our body works in different situations. Am I doing something that's going to make me expend energy all day long? Or am I doing something for a short period of time that I need to just be able to put my all into to get this task done? So there's a bunch of different things. We can break some of those things down and kind of get into it, but that's kind of the overview. Does that kind of get things set up right?
keto flu, impossible fasting symptoms that stop you mid-fast, cravings at any hour of the day, or feeling off after a sweaty workout. These are some of the signs that you're low in electrolytes. When I first started keto, I made all of the mistakes. One of the biggest ones was not supplementing with electrolytes. And still, seven years into keto, I often forget how essential electrolytes are. Honestly, it's easy to forget to take electrolytes because, well, a lot of them don't taste very good or work very well. Enter Element, the most delicious, well-balanced electrolyte powder I've personally tried, like ever. Add to water and enjoy any time of day. These electrolytes are salty, as they should be, quenching your thirst and hitting the spot. And the best part, when you head to drinklmnt.com slash KDP, you'll receive a free Element sample pack. You only pay $5 for shipping. The sample pack includes eight packets of Element that includes two citrus, two raspberry, two orange, and two raw unflavored. Go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com forward slash KDP for your free sample pack. I love Element and I really think you're going to too. Again, that's drinkelement.com forward slash KDP to get your free sample pack. And if you don't love it, they will refund your $5. No questions asked. Completely. I agree with you. Um, It totally does. Also, I want to touch on, so the way I see it and what I see in my practice over and over is there's like two type of women that are moving. One that do far too much like high intensity interval training. They're not paying attention to their adrenal status, their thyroid status, and they end up pushing too hard. And then they're the type of women like you mentioned that just avoid strength because they're afraid to get bulky. Do you see that pattern also? Absolutely. And both of them, this is the funny thing about it. Those, those are both outshoots of the same limiting belief or the same misconception. One of them is if I do cardio and I do enough cardio, I'm going to lose fat, but I don't want to get bulky. The other one is if I work harder, I'll lose more fat. But both of them are rooted in the idea that the type of work that you do determines how much fat you have in your body and what your body's going to look like. And that for both of them, that's a misconception and that's incorrect. So on the cardio, the cardio side where it's, I'm going to do cardio. I don't want to exercise and lift weights. They're missing out on all the benefits that moving their body in all the different ways is going to help them with their quality of life. So being able to squat and, and bend over and push things and pull things and carry things, those activities aren't happening for them. So they have injuries, they, their knees hurt, their backs hurt, they hurt their shoulder when something happens. If they have to carry something, they can't. It's hard to do things throughout the house, things like that. And all they're doing is the workouts that they're doing from the cardio perspective are just making them have to spend more and more and more and more time doing those workouts because their body's only working while they're doing the exercise. They're not building a foundation for metabolic function that had, that doesn't require exercise. On the other side, we have the women that go and work out and do 20,000 steps a day. They do a hit class four days a week. They do a spin class two days a week, uh, whatever it is, maybe the, the exercise fanatics, they're trying to work it off. And in many cases, just like you said, they're going so far, their body never gets a chance to recover. They're getting the benefit of moving their body in a bunch of different ways because oftentimes, you know, hit training is full body kind of functional movement. The problem is they're overdoing it. So they're getting the same results as somebody who's not moving in those ranges of motion and those body uh, movements because they're overdoing it. And now their body's breaking down in those movements. So sure they can squat, but every time they squat, it hurts. They have the same aches and pains as somebody who's not doing anything because they're never giving their body a chance to rest. And understanding that growth and development when it comes to fitness, when it comes to any system, but particularly fitness, growth and development and progress in your fitness journey happens during the rest periods. So if you never give your body a chance to rest, you're only ever adding stress on top of stress on top of stress, and you never get a chance to recover from that to be able to perform at a better function. Makes so much sense. So I know that this is so individualized and I just want to see how you handle this question. What is the best workout plan? Like you've said, um, you've said a lot of things about, it sounds like not pushing too hard, not going too soft, doing strength, maybe doing a little bit of high intensity interval training, moving in different directions. But what does that look like all together as a summary? Yeah, CrossFit. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) 
and I, I say that jokingly, but absolutely 100% seriously. If someone is looking for a program to join where they want to go to a gym, they want to actually get into a face-to-face community with people and have somebody who's coaching them, who's in face watching what they're doing and helping them progress from where they are to where they can be, then CrossFit is the combination of all of the things I just talked about. Okay, It's based on the idea that Movement is designed, exercise and fitness, the purpose of exercise and fitness is to improve your body's ability to do things. That's what CrossFit is about. So whatever you may have seen on TV or think you know about CrossFit, that is not the CrossFit that you're going to find in your local gym. The CrossFit you're going to find in your local gym is going to be about all the seven essential movements. How does your body move? It's going to be about what are the components that we can affect from a fitness perspective? How can we help you get stronger? How can we help you improve your coordination and balance? How can we help you have stamina and endurance? How can we help your flexibility and your quality of movement? And then it's also going to help in all the different ways that we do things. We do things for long periods of time. We do activities for short periods of time. And it puts all that stuff together in a way that because you have a coach who's got eyes on you in the class, there is somebody there to help make sure that you're doing it at a way that is appropriate for your current level. So you're not going into a class where they're going to say, Hey, here's 500 pounds. Have fun. You know, when I was, when I was cross, when I was a CrossFit coach and when I own my gym, you know, every CrossFit gym has PVC pipes. Okay. Five or six foot long PVC pipes that weigh about a pound. If that, 32, you know, 18 ounces, 20 ounces, something like that, pound to pound and a half, that for beginners, they use a PVC pipe to do all the movements because they don't know how to do the movements. So we have to teach them how to do the movements with zero intensity, zero added weight until their movement patterns improve there, which is even with no weight, if you're improving your quality of movement, you are improving your health and your fitness. And that's where a lot of people uh, miss the whole idea is it's not about how much weight you move. It's not about how big your muscles are. If you Your current level of fitness is sitting on the couch and you can get up off that couch and walk up the stairs, go to the bathroom, and then you come back downstairs and you have to take a break for 10 minutes because that was too much work for you. Then you're improving your fitness if you can get to a a point where you can do that two times in a day. That's improving your fitness. So when you hear people say, if you're, this is something that irks me a little bit, I'll be honest, people that are severely obese shouldn't exercise because it adds to their stress. People who um, are going through menopause should reduce the level of intense exercise because it adds to their stress. The level of exercise that you need should be a level that provides hormetic stress so that you can improve from where you are. That doesn't mean you don't do any, and that doesn't mean you need to overdo it. Anybody who's even healthy, I'm 50 years old, I work out five or six days a week, I can overdo it. There's no special case that makes working out extra stress for me, if that makes sense. Completely. And so (laughs) I did CrossFit for four years. I found it to be really competitive and a super unhealthy environment for me to be personally, just because I am quite competitive. And what I found, (laughs) like I would just push it way too hard because I would see other people pushing it too hard. It was just not, it was not healthy for me. But what I did notice, and maybe you have a tip for other people, because maybe this is an ongoing issue, depending on where you go. I've gone to some CrossFit gyms where the coaches really don't know much about how the body should be looking during those movements. Do you have any tips on how to look for a good CrossFit gym if somebody isn't psycho competitive like me and can like be around other people working out? (laughs) Yep. The same way you look for a good bar. Do you mean like a drinking bar? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. There's a good bar every time. If you move to a new city back in the day when you drank, I'm assuming nobody listening to your podcast drinks alcohol because we know what that does to you. Okay. But when you used to drink, when I used to drink, I'll use myself as an example. When I'd move into a new town, one of the things I would do is I'd try out different bars and I'd go, you know, do I like the bartenders? What's the atmosphere like? Are the people friendly? Do they make good drinks? What's on the menu? What kind of music do they play? How close is it? Is it a dirty place? Is it a clean place? You know, do they take care of the bathrooms? You look at all these things. Like, do I feel like this is a bar that I could come to all the time? What things do they have on the TV? Do they show one, the, just the local football game on Sundays? Or do they have direct ticket and show all the football games on Sundays? So these are all these things you're evaluating. Do the exact same thing when you go to a gym. If you're going to a CrossFit gym, and I use this example, when I started doing CrossFit, I was just turning 40. And the gym that I went to was run by two young guys who were D1 athletes in college. They were in their mid twenties and they were going to the games. Their goal was to go to the games, which they did end up doing. They went to the CrossFit games Um, and they attracted younger 
very athletic, very sports, very competitive type people. And I was there for about a year. And then I decided I needed to find somewhere else because that's not what I'm almost 40 years old. I'm here to get healthy. I need to find a, a community and an atmosphere that's going to help me improve where I'm, where I'm at and where I'm going. I'm not trying to get to the game. So I don't need that level of intensity. So I found a gym that was in a different area. That's where I ended up first coaching because that was run by two women who were in their 50s who were much more about quality of life and trying to bring people in to help them improve their everyday activity, not trying to get to the games. That was much more conducive to being patient with learning how to do movements, being patient with progressing through weights and scales of exercise. And it fit my style and it fit where I was going much, much better. So if you're looking at joining a CrossFit gym, if you're looking at joining F45, if you're looking at joining Orange Theory, any of the brands, any of the different chains that are out there, try them all. They all offer a free class. They all offer a chance to come in, maybe try it for a week and see what which one seems to fit your style a little bit better. Where you're going? Do you get along with the coaches? Are the coaches attentive? If they are attentive, are they telling you things that actually work? Are the people friendly? Do you get high fives? Do people cheer you on? Um, things like that. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Two more questions in relation to movement, and then we'll move on to motivation. You mentioned a little bit about recovery. What are your thoughts on acting? recovery. That's like a big thing. But yeah. what are your thoughts? I think when it comes to recovery, uh, the whole process, you'll find a, a, a common theme through most of what I talk about and how I look at this whole process from nutrition and fitness. And that is we have to be very okay with trial and error in our own lives. So when it comes to recovery, there's a, there's a concept called maximum recovery volume, which is basically how much work can you do and then give yourself a set amount of rest to be able to perform that work at the same level the next time. If you do too much work, then your rest time may need to increase, but you have to play around with what that is. And the same thing goes with active recovery. Sometimes, and this is a problem, people use active recovery as an excuse to do more work and they're not actually getting active recovery. Okay. So you have to be careful. What is active recovery? You have to do find that for yourself. That's doing something to maintain movement without adding intensity that creates a stimulus. Okay. I'll say that again. Active recovery is doing something that maintains movement. Okay. So you're moving your body. You're, you're telling your body, Hey, I need to stay loose. I want to move. I'm active. I'm doing something, but I'm not trying to change anything or improve anything because what happens is if I'm doing something to create a stimulus, that's going to create an adaptation. That means I'm adding stress. And the whole idea of active recovery is to not add stress. So active recovery is great. If you want to go for a walk, don't go for a walk and make it, I'm trying to get my 25, 30,000 steps in, in this walk, right? I'm going to go for a mile or two mile walk. I'm going to go for a mile walk. I'm going to walk for 15 or 20 minutes, something like that. And then I'm going to come home and it's a chill walk. I'm, I'm sauntering. I'm strolling on this walk. I'm not speed walking. Okay. Don't get on the treadmill for, for, or the elliptical for 35 or 45 minutes at a level 10 and call it active recovery. That's not active recovery. <laughs> Completely. Okay. So we talked a bunch about movements and you mentioned, you know, getting up off the couch as being some, you know, if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. A bunch of us are on a budget. Are there specific types of moves that one should be really good at? Like you mentioned squats. Are there other th like three top movements that you would say everyone should be able to do or work on? Yeah, I'll give you seven. Seven. Oh my goodness. Yes. Bonus <laughs> round. Let's go. Okay. Seven. So there are seven essential movements. A lot of people like to say six, but I add a third one in there because it, because I, it, because I think it's special. We should be able to squat. So sitting, sitting down in a chair and standing up again, that's a squat. If you get, if you have a trouble getting up and down out of a chair, you need to work on squatting. And that means you just get up and down in your chair more often. Uh, we should be able to hinge our hips. So that means bending over. So tying your shoes, picking something, something up off the floor. Those are things that we need to be able to do. Lunging, walking up the stairs is a lunging motion. We need to be able to apply pressure with our legs one leg at a time. That helps with balance and coordination. We need to be able to push things. We need to be able to pull things. Okay. We need to be able to carry things and we need to be able to twist our body or resist the rotation of our body. So if something is trying to twist us, we need to be able to be strong in the core to resist that rotation. So those are the seven things that, you know, you can think about how do I do that? Okay. Uh, how do I get better at carrying things? Well, go grab, uh, if you got a pet, if you got a dog, go grab the biggest bag of dog foods you can and carry it around your house for 20 minutes. Go in your backyard and walk around with it. Get a couple jugs of milk or water or a couple buckets and fill them up with dirt. Walk around your backyard. That's a great way to carry things. Doing, reaching, uh, taking a, 
taking that same bag and putting it up over your head and then putting it on the ground, right? Do that 10 times a day. There's there's a bunch of different things that you can do with just your body and household items that will get you started uh, in the process of improving your fitness. But those are what we call the seven essential movements. And those are the things that everyone should be trying to work on. There are programs. I have a program that you can get that's super cheap. From a month, It's a monthly subscription that has a body weight version where you can just follow the body weight pro- workouts three days a week. There you go right to your phone. You get instructions on how to do them. And we go through all seven of those movements in different comments, seven of those movements in different combinations to help improve all of it. I really hope you're enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. You can snap a pic and tag me at Leanne Vogel or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. That's awesome. I know. And if anyone's motivated, owning a boat and maintaining a boat requires you to do all of those things. I know on a daily basis, I'm like pushing my groceries in a cart across the dock and it's a 20 minute walk even to just get to the car with a big cart and I'm pushing and I'm pulling and I'm, you know, so um, those sorts of things. um, Super helpful. If you've always wanted a boat and you're trying to convince your significant other, now's the time you can say that it's healthy. Like it's the healthiest thing you can do for your body. (laughs) Maybe not for your bank account, but definitely for your body. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's shift gears and end with motivation because as we get started with things, I think we have a false expectation of what a movement protocol or what a diet protocol will look like. How do we stay motivated when we're working really hard, we're eating well, and things just aren't changing as we want them to change or changing at all? Yeah. Uh, the first thing to realize is we need to broaden the things that we're looking at to, to gauge success. I think that's one of the biggest things. We tend to get stuck on or fixated on a single metric. And if that metric doesn't change, we, we get frustrated, but we're missing the 80 different things that are happening on the outside that are actually getting better. And the biggest one, uh, I think you see it as much as I do, is, is people look at the scale and the, the scale's not moving, so I must not be doing anything right. And that is one of the biggest fallacies and limiting beliefs that people have. The one thing I like about the definition of fitness when it comes to, when I, when I talk about what is fitness, the things we talked about already, there's seven movements, there's 10 components of fitness, okay? Like I said, balance, strength, agility, endurance, power, speed, coordination, those types of things are components that, are, that we look at when we talk about fitness. Our body's ability to process fuel in different ways based on the activities we're doing. And then we get into body composition, how much body fat do you have, how much muscle mass do you have? How well can you move? How much energy do you have throughout the day? How do you feel? What kind of mood are you in? How can you think? What kind of um, attitude do you have on a regular basis? How do you relate to friends? How much work can you get done in a day? There are uh, there's a cornucopia of, of things that we can look at to gauge our success on this journey. And if all you're looking at is the weight on your scale, you are completely missing the point. So that's the first thing I would recommend to people is if you're if you're feeling frustrated and stuck, broaden your scope. Look at other things and try to understand that fitness and health and metabolic function have nothing to do with the weight. In fact, I would even go far as to say, if you want to have more motivation and be less frustrated with your process, completely forget about weight loss because weight loss is a symptom of all the other things not being the way they need to be. If you fix your metabolism, if you fix your fitness, if you fix your lean mass, if you fix all of these other things, your weight is going to take care of itself. It does every single time. So I think that's step number one. Broaden your scope. There's more things to look at than what you're looking at now. The second thing to realize is if you're getting if you're getting frustrated, if you're struggling, if you're feeling tempted, you, you want to go off the off the, the plan or whatever it may be, you have to 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 work on the idea that you you need to have an emotional connection to why you're doing what you're doing. We often talk to people, I often work with clients, and one of the first things I do when I get a new client is I spend time helping them dig into what their motivation is. What is the one thing that they're looking to do that is going to change their life that is emotionally activating for them? So if I, for, for me, I'll just use myself as an example. My grandmother passed three years ago. My grandmother was a, was a huge impact on my life. And when she passed, she passed very slowly over a period of years. And she got weaker and weaker and weaker. The day I said goodbye to her, she was laying face down in a bed. She could barely hold my hand and, and to say goodbye. 
watching her deteriorate and then afterwards learning what I did about health and fitness and nutrition and what it meant to improve your quality of life and be physically independent. My driving factor is a combination of passion uh, for never... I don't want anyone to ever have to do that and live through that with a loved one. So I want to get as many people as possible uh, to understand that fitness is a requirement for quality of life. You can get a six pack in the kitchen. You cannot get it the best life possible unless you're doing fitness. So that that's one of the things is there's an emotional, there's a regret there. There's a sadness there. There's something that, that elicits an emotional reaction to me when I think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. And if you don't have that, the emotions that you have that are connecting you to the food and to the lack of exercise, to sitting on the couch watching Netflix instead of getting up and working out, the emotional connection you have to those things that you're comfortable with will be stronger than your stated desire to do something different, okay? Because it's emotion versus emotion. If there's no emotion on the moving forward side, then the staying where you are side is going to win every single time. So finding your why and digging into something that is emotionally connected is the key. A lot of people say, I want to lose weight. Okay, great. That's great. Why do you want to lose weight? What do you think that weight loss is going to do for you in your day-to-day life? Oh, well, if I lose weight, then I'm going to feel better about myself. Okay, why don't you feel better about yourself right now? Well, because I don't feel like I'm setting a good example for my kids. Okay. Why don't you feel like you're setting a good, a good example for your kids? Well, because if I'm not doing something to improve myself, then I feel like I'm stagnant and I'm just going to get worse. Okay. Why don't you want to get worse? What is it you're afraid of that not doing this and setting a bad example for your kids is going to do? And you just dig, you keep asking yourself question after question after question to get to something that is so emotionally rooted in why you want this, that nothing is going to stand in your way. Completely. That is the best, best, best advice. I love what you shared there. Um, what advice do you have for people like earlier, we were talking about the important movements like squatting and lunges and pushing and pulling and what do you also say? Twisting and resisting rotation, all those ones. Um, what if we can't do those basic movements? Like what if we can't get out of our chair? What if it feels just so incredibly embarrassing and even just going through this just feels so heavy and scary and like it's never going to work. Do you have any encouragement for those individuals? So there's a, there's a difference between can't physically can't do a movement and don't want to do it because it's embarrassing. All right. There's that, there's at some point, again, this is the, this is where the why discussion comes into play. If we're talking about, you're just embarrassed to try then you you got to tell you sometimes understanding the why you don't want things to happen in your life is more important than talking about why you do want things to happen. So what are the things that you're afraid of will be the same five years from now, a year from now, if you don't get up and do these exercises? Sure, you can be embarrassed, but will you still be embarrassed a year from now when you still can't do it? Or is it better to get over that embarrassment and try now? And in a year, you'll be able to do anything. And now you can be proud of where you're at. The potential for pride in what you do and accomplish should override any fear you have of being embarrassed trying. So that's one aspect that we can look at. The physical inability to do a movement based on an injury or some kind of physical limitation, that's where having a coach and having a program or somebody that can actually help you identify what you're capable of. The mindset of what I can't do is always going to stop you in your tracks. But if you can switch that and reframe that conversation to what are the things I can do, now you have opportunity for growth. So what you can't do is what you can't do. If you can't change that, if you are missing a leg, you can't change that. Why are you worried about what you can't do with that leg? What can you do with your arms? What can you do with your other leg? What are the things that are on the table that you can affect and improve your quality of life starting today instead of focusing on the things that are going to hold you back? It's almost like you've encouraged a lot of people before with ways to use words to encourage them. Thank you so much. (laughs) That was so beautiful. (laughs) Yes, completely. Coach Bronson, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your brilliance and going through diet and workout and motivation and just really helping us get a better grasp on these three aspects and how they interplay with each other. Where can people learn more from you? Yeah. So I have a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and look up Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness, I've got a ton of stuff there. Uh, My website is ultimateketogenicfitness.com. And I'm on Instagram at uh, coach underscore Bronson underscore keto. Wonderful. 
wonderful. Awesome. Oh, and don't forget my book. I got my book on 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 Amazon at uh, Ultimate. It's the Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness Book, um, which is awesome because it's basically me. If you buy that book, you're buying me, and you can put me in your back pocket. <laughs> I love that so much. Oh, that's so great. Thank you so much for those resources. And I know that I checked out a bunch of them in pre preparation for this interview and I loved what I saw. So definitely head on over there, guys, in his book, The Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness Book. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I hope you really enjoyed this one. Again, you can connect with Coach Bronson on his Instagram, coach underscore Bronson underscore keto. And his website is ultimateketogenicfitness.com. Have a great rest of your Tuesday and we will see you back here next week for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. Music for the Keto Diet Podcast provided by Yechi. Follow Jacob on Instagram at Yechi underscore official and on Spotify as Yechi. That's Y-E-C-H-I. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.